Great. Well, um, 20 years of teaching, I know that this is the graveyard slot. After lunch, on a Saturday. So um, we, need, uh, we need God's strength. So why don't, why don't we pray? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, that you have uh, fed us physically, sustained us now, Lord. Pray, Lord, that as we come to your word, we thank you that it is such great, rich, wonderful food. And that, um, Lord, that uh, you'd keep us uh, awake uh, and alert as we think about now how we bring to bear the wonderful good news of Jesus uh, to people who do not know him. Amen. Um, can you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? So we're going to get back to the magnetic points soon, but we're doing it by way of 1 Corinthians 1. One Corinthians one verses eighteen to twenty five. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. What is the relationship between the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified, and the world around us? And I wanted to suggest two things, and this is central to our, the teaching that I want to um, do with you this afternoon. The first thing to note is that the message of the cross, Christ crucified, will always confront and contradict the world's ways of thinking about things. What the world thinks is wise in all its different forms, God thinks is foolish and vice versa. The message of the cross is a big fat no to the world's ways of doing things. Um, I've, I've only done, I've done a Radio 4 program once, I wasn't invited back. <laughs> it was um, Beyond Belief with Ernie Ray, which is a program that... Um, uh, uh, talks about religious topics. I think he's a guy from Northern Ireland. And uh, they, what, they invited me on to talk about the topic of hell and final judgment, because I'd done some writing on that. And there was me, there was a, uh, a Catholic journalist, and there was a, a, a theology lecturer who um, believed in judgment and hell, but it had absolutely nothing to do with what the Bible said. I was there as the fundamentalist. And um, we started talking, and I said, I, I, believe in a, I believe the day is coming. I believe in final judgment. Um, and the, the guests in the studio, they were horrified. How can you believe in that bloody medievalism? Believe in a final judgment? They were really offended that I believed in the idea of judgment and hell. But what's interesting is that they were offended by judgment and hell, but they were equally offended by grace. What, you mean that someone on their deathbed could confess their sins and they'd been forgiven? Do you see, that's the foolishness of the gospel message. People are offended by judgment and by grace at the same time. It's foolishness. 
But that is the message that we preach. And there will always be, as we engage with people who do not know the Lord Jesus, there will always be a line of pain, I suppose. It's never, never a smooth transition. I remember in Acts 17, Paul starts with the unknown God, but at the end he calls people to repent, turn around. So the message of the cross always confronts. But the message of the cross always connects as well. In this passage that I read, notice what Paul does here. He talks about two different ethnic groups, Jews and Greeks. Jews are not Greeks, Greeks are not Jews. They're different ethnic groups. They're like Scottish people and English people. Both of those groups look, are looking for different things. Jews, their hopes, dreams, aspirations are around the idea of power and signs. Greeks, well, they're not Jews. They're not looking for power and signs. Their big thing is wisdom. They both have these central themes about their, the way they view the world, what they think are the things that should be made visible and valuable. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. Now, here's the question. Why does Paul mention those two different groups? He could have said, I don't care what Jews think about. I don't care what Greeks think about. I just preach Christ crucified. I don't care. I could be talking to you and I'm in Aberdeen. I could be in Slovakia. I could be in Melbourne. Who cares about the context? We just preach Christ crucified. But no, Paul mentions these two groups. Look, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. Look, a stumbling block to Jews, confrontation. Foolishness to Gentiles, confrontation. But to those whom God has saved, look what he says. Both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And we say, oh Paul, you've let the side down. This is a felt needs gospel. You mean Jews are looking for power and you're saying Jesus is power? Greeks are looking for wisdom and Jesus is wisdom? Yes, but here's the thing. In exactly the opposite way that Jews and Greeks thought that power and wisdom would be delivered. A crucified Messiah is not powerful. A crucified Messiah is not wise. And yet Paul still makes the connection between the hopes and dreams of that culture and with the gospel message. Now do you see the importance of this? We preach Christ crucified, but it's not an abstract 30,000 feet above the air who cares what the context is? We preach Christ crucified in a way that speaks to Jews who are looking for power and Greeks who are looking for wisdom and Abaddonians who are looking for... That's what we've been discussing this morning. That's where we get the traction. If Paul had preached Christ crucified and, and wisdom to Jews, it wouldn't have kind of touch them in the same way but Paul does the work the Jewish ethnic group are looking for this the Greek ethnic group are looking for this your contemporary Scot is looking for whatever the contemporary Scot is looking for and we preach Christ crucified in a way that confronts but also in a way that connects again back to Acts 17 Paul could have said, why am I bothering wandering around the, object, the objects of worship? Who cares that they've got an unknown God? We're just going to talk about Jesus. That was the point. He had been, and they said, we do not understand what you are talking about. So he confronts and he connects. And so, the gospel is a message that confronts, and the gospel is a message that connects. The gospel subverts every other way of viewing the world, but the gospel always fulfills every other way of 
viewing the world. And here's this idea, this phrase. It's not even my phrase. I've tried to build a career on it for 20 years. This idea of subversive fulfillment. The gospel subverts and fulfills every other way of viewing the world. And of course, our hope is not simply in a what, but a who. We offer people Jesus Christ, a person. So this idea of confrontation and connection, this idea of subversion and fulfillment is very important in this whole issue that we're talking about. Because, and again, we'll come on to this little box I've got in the handout soon, but because what I want to do with these magnetic points is to argue these itches that people have to scratch. Remember what we did this morning? Totality, norm, deliverance, destiny, higher power. Jesus Christ both confronts the way people are trying to answer these points, but he also fulfills them as well. Now, in another book I did before the magnetic book that you've got today, called Plugged In, um, I do, there's a way in which we can kind of uh, see how Paul does this in Acts 17, and that's what we've been doing this morning. So, Paul enters into the world... I walked around and looked for your objects of worship. We were doing that this morning. That's, as I said to you, that's what you were doing in those small groups in a very kind of embryonic way, but you were doing it. You were thinking, hey, yeah, I wonder what my, my friend who doesn't know Jesus, I wonder how they find connection, or I wonder where they look for their deliverance, or I wonder whether they think they're in control or not. And we've been exploring those issues as well. And now what we have to do, and this is what we find difficult, is there has to be a way of exposing those false ways of viewing the world or those magnetic points that we've been looking for. Here's the thing, you know, people are scratching an itch, but uh, as you'll know if you've had chicken pox or mumps or anything and you scratch and your mum and dad say, don't scratch, the more you scratch, the more irritated it gets. And that's what happens with idolatry. We look for idols to answer the, ways in, the, the, the way in which only God can answer. And it just leads to our destruction. So there has to be a way in which we are exposing those idols. And then we have a wonderful thing to do. We can show off the gospel as both the message that confronts and the message that connects. So this afternoon, what we're about is about trying to work out, well, how do I expose and how do I evangelize? And my argument is that if we take each one of those magnetic points, Jesus is not just the way in which we find connection. Jesus is the connection. He's the answer. He is the, the way in which we confront and connect. And what I'm suggesting is that this is uh, no newfangled doctrine. It's not a new thing that we're discovering. It's orthodox Christian belief. But communicated in a way that gets traction with the ways in which other people have, have been answering the magnetic points. So look, let me get, this is a bit abstract. Let me give you some examples. Let's take this point of connection. Um, the idea of the magnetic point of connection is that people are looking for belonging. They're looking for kind of significance and identity. Uh, in your groups, just for a minute, give me a way in which those things that we mentioned this morning, family, football club, Um, conspiracy theory, you know, any way that we find belonging. Scottish nationalism. Show me a way in which we would say to people, how do we expose those things as not, as being fakes, really? They can't be pretend, they're not very good pretend gods. 
What are the implications? Again, let me give you an, an illustration here in, in the way that what I'm looking for. In Jeremiah chapter 2, this is talking about God's covenant people, how much those outside. It says, my people have committed two sins. They've turned from the fount of living water and they've turned to cisterns, pots that cannot hold water. The idea is people are drinking from the stagnant pool and we have a fount of living water. But what we need to do, remember, this morning, wake people up, get them to stop and think. How do we get people to stop and think, those people who are looking for belonging in anything other than in the Lord Jesus? How do we expose that? What are the, what are the things that we would want to point out? How do we show that every idol has, a feet, has, has feet of clay? How do we prick the bubble? I mean, I, I don't know how many other illustrations, metaphors I can use, yeah? You see what, what, what we need to do? We have to, ex- we have to show people this is a stagnant pool of water. It's a good thing, but if you make it into a God thing, it will destroy you. And it will destroy your relationship with the one who created you. My question is, we need, how do we show people that? From the things that we've been saying this morning, the people who are looking for connection in all kinds of things. So this is a challenge. This is hard. It's really hard after lunch. It's hard. Just in your groups for a minute, just think. Because, you, I mean, look, at the end of the day, you could just say to people, anyone you meet, you could say, okay, I don't care. I'm not going to bother around wandering. Just, you, you just need to believe in Jesus. Repent and believe. Yeah? There's a guy, when I go and watch West Ham, occasionally now, because I live in Newcastle, as the thousands stream towards the stadium, there's a guy there, a bro- I, I've no doubt he's, made, he's undoubtedly a brother in Christ. As the thousands stream towards the London Stadium, he's standing with a megaphone shouting Bible verses, calling people to repent and believe. Do I think God could cause a massive revival amongst those thousands of West Ham fans and they could all come to faith in Christ? Of course I do! Do I think that is the most effective method of evangelism and witness in 2022? Of course I don't. So the question here is not about can God deal, can God save people out of anything? Of course he can do that, but I do think there are more and less effective ways to engage a culture. And I'm saying if we want to get traction... I think we need to listen carefully to the culture around us. Jews look for power, Greeks look for wisdom, what the Scottish people look for, and then how does Jesus both confront and connect? And these magnetic points are helpful because they break it down one level. So, let's go back to our example I want you to discuss. This idea of belonging and totality. How do we show that these, putting our ultimate commitment in anything other than Christ is going to be futile and the feet of clay. How do we show the feet of clay in your groups? Just for a few minutes. This is hard. I'll help you in a minute. But this is what we have to do in your groups. Go.
Okay, let's come back. Again, I know that this, is, this gets the kind of the, the grey matter working. Uh, but yeah, so we're looking for ways in which we can show how the ways that we're looking for belonging and identity are futile if they're not found in Christ what would be some of the things that we might want to say given the examples we gave this morning? This is where you have to be brave and speak up for us. We're going to have a long afternoon. You were talking about something. <laughs> Yes, not yes. So there's a reliability question. Yeah, what? So these things can do well for a certain amount of time, but there was a, there's always the other side. Um, the, there's a more, I suppose, an ugly side or a side that shows that it cannot give ultimately what we're looking for. Um, so, for example, I mean, I mentioned this. Um, you know, people, I, I think the sport thing's interesting because sometimes say, oh, yeah, people they don't really worship sport. It's not that important. But it is important. And it's pointing out, for example, that when England play football and England lose, domestic violence rates do go up. Um, we had a student who ended up writing a poem for me about how his childhood had been governed by what was going to happen at home depended upon whether the team would win or lose that day. The team won, brilliant. The team lost, the kid would be moved out of the house for the evening because dad would be in a bad mood. Now that's why it's important, yeah? So it's though it's, though it's showing these kinds of cracks that, yeah, there's a great sense of identity that you get, but also then what happens when you're on the outside of any of these things? Um, and it's showing that, yeah, they can't... The things that we want to make gods out of, uh, they promise a lot, but they cannot and they do not deliver. Um, David? I know you're, you're asking for the good stuff. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so, well, welcome to Wrexham, who did his bus show that is... <laughs> yes. So, you, you're obviously enjoying it, yeah. <laughs> Yep. You're still damaged. Yes. You're still in the wrong. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about storytelling in itself. Yeah. Showing real people and real relationships. And I would be saying to them, yeah, but you're still not speaking to your son or your daughter. And I'd say they'd say, yeah, but we're probably related. It's more difficult when the idol was in the ascendancy. I mean, it was often the idol is winning for us. Yeah. But I, well, I think um, at, that, at, at that point, they are totally in thrall of the idol. I think you, we, we just have to patiently say that that will not always be the case. Uh, and that, uh, again, that's not going to, that's not them being up the top of the level. I mean, again, it shows how much we are captivated by the idol if, when we get that terminal diagnosis, or that the idol, it won't save us from death. And again, if all we can do is point out, I think, 
the, the destructiveness of it, and on the other hand, the, um, uh, the what well, we'll come on to, the beauty of Christ and what that means, to, to, to replace that. Um, I th- yeah, I, it is just trying to, in lots of ways, to kind of prick the bubble. I, d- I mean, I, I can't, apart from, I don't know whether there's a different argument you can use apart from realising that is someone who is very hardened. But our job, I think, is just to show, present. And sometimes I think, and again, we need to be sensitive to this, sometimes people are, you can expose the idol most when people are most exposed in their lives. I, I was saying this to you earlier on. Sometimes with some of this stuff about, you know, broken relationships and death and, you know, illness, when you're young, I can say to students, you know, you guys sitting over there, some of this stuff, it will just go over you at the moment. You know, you've got nothing to worry about. Life's ahead of you. This, this stuff's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Soon you will realize that it's all about this a lot of the time. And that's when the opportunities come. Not to say they don't come a, earlier on, but I'd love you, you guys to be thinking, oh, there was this guy 20 years ago who said this would happen, and actually now it is happening, and I've got something to, you know... Um, yeah, I don't know, I'd be happy for you to come back on that, though, if you, if you think there's another... There's a, I'm missing something on, the, on that. I mean, I just remember, I always remember, it's an extreme example, but it is showing also the kind of... Yeah, it's the wake-up call, it's the kind of the pastoral wake up from the dream, the throwing cold water on something. I always remember when uh, uh, President Obama became the, the, it was the last Democrat rally before he became the official nomination. And they interviewed this lady at one of the rallies and she said, this is amazing. If Obama becomes president, I'll never have to pay my mortgage again. It's that kind of, like, I know that's an extreme example, but it's the unreality of what we're investing in. Um, and as someone said, as someone over lunch said really helpfully, the, the things that we make gods, we do it because we're sinners. Because, again, we'd rather, for example, this idea of fate, in some ways, it's a horrible idea that there's this kind of impersonal force. But fate is really helpful for sinners. Why? Because on the one hand, it does give some meaning to why things happen. It was fate. On the other hand... Fate's great because fate is impersonal. I can do what I want. Fate doesn't care. And in my sinful nature, that's great. To know that there is some meaning, but that actually I'm still not accountable, that's how we twist the truth all the time. So the gods that we make are very convenient for us as we wrestle. The the worst thing for sinful humanity is the idea of an absolute personal god who we are dependent upon and accountable to. But we like to suppress the truth. And so what we have to do is to say, no, you are dependent and you are accountable to this God. And that's where the repentance comes in. Idolatry is not... Remember the Puritans' you know, favourite verse is, you know, to, to you and you alone, God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Idolatry creates a lot of problems, but it's ultimately against God. And we do have to point that out. Um, just on that um, connection one again, this is where, and again, I, David will be pleased that I'm saying this, this is where theology is really important. You know, I think the best cultural engagers will be those who are deeply into theology. Why? Well, this idea of connection. Remember, connection is the struggle to say, am I significant or am I insignificant? I can't work it out. Some philosophies, some ways of viewing the world say that we are literally gods. Other things say you are nothing. You're just a kind of, you know, if I added up the minerals in your body, we'd be about 18 pounds or something. I don't know what it is, you know. Are we significant or insignificant? What's a key truth about humanity that answers that question amazingly that we've discussed already today? Who are, what are human beings? Who are they? Right, we're made in the image of God. How does the image of God answer the significance and insignificance question? Are we significant? Why are we significant? We're made in the image of God. Why are we insignificant? 
Yeah, we're only images. We're not God. The Im- what an amazing doctrine. Please don't ever use that doctrine and think, oh, we're just made in the image of God. That's the foundation of human dignity. That's the foundation of us being able to answer the question, well, in a sense, we have amazing significance because we're, we, are, we are made in God's image. But we are not God. We are only images of God. Philosophers have been wrestling with that question for thousands of years and we have it revealed to us. We're images of God. That gives us our orientation as to who we are. Isn't that, isn't that just amazing? Yeah? We want connection. But so often our lives are about disconnection. We're disconnected. We're disconnected from... And this is what I'd want to be saying to people. We are disconnected. We're disconnected from ourselves. The environmental question is about being dis- disconnected from creation. And all of those are symptoms of being disconnected from the one who made us. All this is is kind of Christian theology, but in a way that tries to answer the questions or the, the issues that people are dealing with, which are theological issues. Jesus is the way that we live. Jesus is the norm. You know, G- Jesus does present a standard. Jesus is, in a sense, those of you who are more conservatively minded in your temperament or in your kind of politics or whatever, Jesus is a great conservative. There are moral laws and rules that Jesus presents, that Jesus is. But Jesus is also for, or Jesus is actually against, hypocrisy. He's against rules for rules' sake. He's against the mar- he's, he's against those who want to push out the marginalised. So Jesus is both conservative and progressive at the same time, in a way that should confound conservative and progressive at the same time. Jesus says, do not think I've come to abolish the law. I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfil them. Jesus presents a standard, but this is where I suppose the doctrine of sin is good news because Jesus is the saviour when we fall from that standard. Isn't that an amazing thing? Some of you will have heard of this book by um, um, Douglas Murray, the conservative cultural critic called The Madness of Crowds. He's a gay atheist guy, interesting book. But there's the tragic bit about that book is he has this little section where he says, part of the problem of our culture is that we've lost the idea of forgiveness. I don't know where we'll find that from, the idea of forgiveness. Jesus, is, Jesus gives us a standard. In fact, Jesus says, the standard is so high, none of you can keep it. But he did. And Jesus offers forgiveness and reconciliation and restoration. Isn't that an amazing answer to cancel culture? Isn't that an amazing way that we can deal with disappointments in our lives? Jesus is the way out. Jesus says that all of the mini deliverances that we're looking for are actually symptomatic of a bigger deliverance that we need. Yes, there's lots of kind of uh, 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 symptoms, but the real diagnosis is that we, did, we need deliverance from God and his wrath against sin. Jesus is the way of control. You know, again, this is a wonderful truth. I, um, when I used to get a taxi in London, invariably it was um, a Muslim driver with a, and in the, the, um, on the wind mirror it used to be the kind of the, the evil eye to ward off spirits. Common. I mean, I can say as a Christian, I don't deny those evil spirits exist, but I believe in one that's lord over all of those spirits. I don't believe in a malevolent, impersonal force. I believe in a loving Heavenly Father. I don't believe that human beings are just victims, but I believe we have accountability and responsibility, and God's got a plan, and that gives me great freedom as a human being. Now again, these are th- all, do you see what I'm trying to do here? I mean, I could, I could just go up to someone out there, the... the the Just Eat driver who's just driving past. I could stop him on his scooter. I've just seen him. 
I could say, you need to believe in Jesus, repent and believe. But what I need to do is to do that, but in a way that gets traction, because he has hopes, dreams. He's, our, he's living these magnetic points, and we have a way to kind of re- respond. Jesus is the higher power. He is the way beyond. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. So this is where these magnetic points are are really, really helpful. And I hope this just kind of gets the cogs whirring to say, yeah, do do you know what? There's a way in which I can can understand how people are answering these magnetic points, but I could say something to this. Um, And that's why, as I said, theology and deep theology is important because the richer of resources we have, the more we can confront and connect at the same time. Now, before we go on, because we're going to go straight into what was on the session here, session three, and this will clarify even more. Are there any? Are there any? I wonder, I'm interested in any questions at this point on that on that material. People can ask questions, push back. Yeah, I'm glad because I don't want him going on about Wrexham again. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I think part, so the family one's interesting because what we'd want to do is, again, remember, idols are parasitic on the truth. Family is a great thing. Wonderful. I'm not, there's no, there's no kind of, you know, it's a wonderful gift given by God, but he makes a really bad God. So actually, in relativizing family as not being our ultimate aim, I suppose, we actually, it's better for the family because the family then has the place it's meant to have. We will love our husband and wives better. We'll be better parents when we recognize that Jesus is our ultimate. Um, yeah, Jesus is everything in, in, in that sense. And I think, again, that there's a way of, you know, obviously there's different ways of presenting that. And I'm not, this, these sessions aren't so much about how practically the things that you would say, but I'm hoping I'm giving you the lenses through which you then have to try and prick the bubble a little bit. For people whose whole hopes and dreams are around family or legacy or those kinds of things, um, uh, and I think it, yeah, it's two, doing two things, isn't it? It's showing the fount of living water and the crack system. It's not all about deconstruction. It is then wanting to say, well, family is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's terrible how we've made it into this ultimate thing, and that's that's the the problem. Of course, yeah. No, no, it's fine. Yep. Yes, yeah, and of course, when we don't believe something is a gift, then we think that it's ours, and um, that's when there's problems arise as as well. And when we don't live, when we don't, well, and that's the right back to the Romans one, isn't it? We didn't give thanks, and when we don't recognise that there's a giver, then that's that's problematic. And that, and that, how a whole society, if it's not going on that kind of gratitude shape is on the, you know, I, this, this is mine. Um, yeah, and again, some of this is just, again, David's point is if, if people are, like on the Wrexham example again, if people are in thrall of the idol, you know, because the, in some ways, 
the, the closer the counterfeit, the more hard it is to show the real thing. But I think all we can patiently do is, is again, using the illustration of the dream, is gently trying to wake people up to show the reality, get people to stop and think. Um, and we have to do that in very creative ways in the things that we say and the things that, that we do. Any other points to make at this point? Okay, now, here comes the twist in the tail. And this actually is a twist in the tail, but actually, I think if some of you are thinking, oh yeah, I kind of get this, but I don't know what I'd say or whatever, um, he here's what I want to do. Um, Charles Spurgeon took my illustration of the magnet and used it himself. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, there must have been some time travel involved. He preached a sermon uh, at the Metropolitan Tabernacle called The Marvellous Magnet. I mean, come on, plagiarism this is. John 12, 32, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw people to myself. Here's what Spurgeon said. This is what I want to talk to you about now. It is the Spirit of God who puts power into the truth about Christ. And then men and women feel that truth and come to Christ and live... But our blessed Lord and Master uses instruments. The force of Christ's love is sometimes shown to by those who already love him. One Christian makes many. One believer leads others to faith. To come back to my metaphor of the magnet, it's my metaphor of the magnet, you have sometimes seen a battery attached to a coil, and then if you take a nail and you put it on the coil, the nail has become a strong magnet you notice that the nail turns into a magnet for you take another nail and you put it on the end of it and it holds the second nail fast. Now, I've put an ellipsis there because what he does in the... He goes on for about seven nails. You put the fourth nail to the third nail, you get the idea. All the magnetism comes from the first place from which it started. And when it ceases at the fountainhead... There is an end of it altogether. Indeed, Jesus Christ is the great attractive magnet and all must begin and end with him. Thus, from one to another, the mystic influence proceeds, but the whole of the force abides in Jesus. More and more the kingdom grows, ever mighty to prevail, but all the growing and the prevailing come out of him. So it is that Jesus works first by himself and then by all who are in him. May the Lord make us magnets for himself. Now, why is this important? The book that you have been given today, Making Faith Magnetic, was originally given in, to seminary students in courses on evangelism and apologetics. And one day, a few years ago, one of my brightest students, she put her hand up and she said, this is, this is really good stuff, but why, why is this material in the course on evangelism and, and, and apologetics? Surely, shouldn't it be in a class on our own Christian discipleship? I said, what? She said, yeah, look, I need to be applying these magnetic points to my own life in the common struggles that I still have, which are the same as other people's struggles. And when I see how these apply to my own life, as I see how I need to be magnetized by Jesus and not pulled away by other things, so that will give me a feeling of fellow feeling with men and women who don't know Jesus, and that will help my evangelism. In other ways, in other words... This is the big thing, and I'm still working this through in my own mind. It's so obvious. Our evangelism flows from our discipleship. Let me say that again. Our evangelism flows from our discipleship. In some ways, that's the, the better context for the Jeremiah 2 passage. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. 
Spurgeon is saying that we stay magnetized by being attached in union with Christ. And as that happens, so we will be attractive to others who will be attracted by us as we stay to Christ. As soon as we kind of, as soon as that is kind of questioned or, or we start being demagnetized, we will lose our witness and effectiveness. Because we are either being formed by Christ or being deformed by something or someone else. If, you're not, if we're not being drawn to Christ, we will be being drawn away by something else. Friends, that, 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 there is no neutrality here. We're either being drawn by Christ, we're either being magnetized by him, or we're being pulled away. That's why 1 John finishes with, Beloved, keep yourselves from idols. And here's the thing, no one wants to be, no one wants to be spiritually like that fridge magnet that just, you stick it on the fridge and it just slowly goes down and can't hold anything. We don't want to be weak fridge magnets for Christ. We want to be those magnetized fridge magnets that will stick to anything. Now, as I've done this material, and I, um, I kind of, I, there's an email in the book at the end. You can, I, what I want people to do across the world is to think of these magnetic points. And um, I'll ex be expecting a, an essay on Wrexham, please. Uh, right, because I'm trying to get an encyclopedia of cultural examples of, of the magnetic points. And um, uh, a physics teacher wrote to me. I, I'm terrible at any kind of science. But here's what the physics teacher said. Some of you may be science teachers out there. This may, I hope this is true. I hope, I, this is, I hope this isn't kind of just fake news, but this is true. Look, he said, uh, he'd, he'd read the book and he'd heard this stuff. He said, some mag materials can become magnetic when placed into a magnetic field as they are made up of lots of regions called domains, which are essentially just mini magnets. When not in the magnetic field, they align randomly and cancel each other out, so there's no overall magnetic field. But in the presence of an external magnetic field, these domains are then caused to align with the external field. I'm sweating because this takes me back to science classes. So now instead, instead of cancelling each other out, their strengths combine to cause the material to become magnetic as per the diagrams below. Is this true? I'm not getting... Yes, thank you. A science person's nodding. Now, listen to this. Relating it to Spurgeon's illustration, our hearts are like the unmagnetized material. We are fragmented, and our inner desires, commitments, and loves, emotions, beliefs are attracted by different created things. Think David's give me an undivided heart prayer. As Christians, this means that we're not magnetic. What we need is to be close to Christ. As we behold his glory, spend time in his magnetic field, all these inner mini magnets that were all attracted to other things become attracted to him and start again. This then makes us magnetic. I thought that was quite good. Of course, you can push these illustrations to the point of kind of, you know, absurdity, but I think that's great, isn't it? I think that's great. And so what I would love us to do is to recognize, and I say this to myself all the time, you know, look, the, the, the way that we will attract others to the Lord Jesus is as we are magnetized by him. Our evangelism flows from our discipleship. And what I would love us to do is just think for a minute. I deal with this in the book, so you can go over it and spend time. I just want you to think in all of these areas of the magnetic points, where are we tempted to be pulled away by, by other things rather than being magnetized by Christ? Where is it in our lives, in my life, that I look for connection and belonging other than in Christ? Now, at this point, can I borrow a copy of my book because I don't have a copy? Thank you. Thank you. I will try not to break the spine. This is a bit that I think probably I need to um, just help us uh, uh, 
read this because this might be helpful. Um, so think, I wanted you to think about this. This is your own kind of a bit of um, spiritual self-diagnosis. And my argument, remember, is that we, we want to be magnetized, but so often we, the tendency is to be demagnetized. In terms of totality and the way to connect, we can be pulled into thinking that there is no big plan for God to bring all things together. I think lots of Christians feel that. Oh yeah, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but my life and the way I live my life is that I am so anxious and fearful. I think the apocalypse is around the corner. I think lots of Christians feel like that. We feel like that. Life seems random. Nothing seems connected. Perhaps when life is vast, overwhelming and getting on top of me, I see myself as an insignificant nothing. Maybe you're thinking like that this, this afternoon. Or something on the bottom of the divine shoe and not a precious adopted child of God with a glorious inheritance. Or perhaps I know that something else in my life gives me a greater sense of connection and personal significance than the kingdom of God. I, I hope he won't mind me saying this, so, but um, it, might, it might be helpful. He's an evangelist. Graham Daniels, who's the head of Christians in Sport, brilliant evangelist, brilliant godly man. I did this material with the Christians in Sport guys. And um, Graham was very open and honest to say he, he'd not come across this magnetic point material. And he said, look, I know that even for a lot of my Christian life, the way I've answered these magnetic points is through football. That's been my belonging. That's been my norm. That's been my deliverance. The struggle is there with him. He loves the Lord, but he knows that he's constantly been pulled away. I hope he didn't mind me saying that. Perhaps it's my nation, a political ideology, my race, my sexuality and gender, my football club, peer group or friends. Although I say my identity is in Christ, it's these other connections which start to order my priorities to dominate my decisions and affections. What about norms, the way to live? Perhaps I see God's standards and rules as that are constricting me rather than rules that liberate us for our good. Perhaps I think the norm is in, God's law is impersonal and legal and focused on the letter of the law rather than the spirit who inspired it. Perhaps some of you, some of us, think that we can love Jesus without obeying his commands. Maybe we think Jesus' teaching was on the wrong side of history. Perhaps some of you even today are constantly wracked with guilt because you know you've transgressed the norm and you've lost sight that Jesus is both standard and saviour. What about deliverance? Perhaps you, me, we, think that subtly we can be delivered by our routines and our purity. Perhaps we start to focus on fixing some areas of our life, who we live or who we're with, and lose a sense of eternal perspective. Perhaps we implicitly play down that we've been delivered from hell and the finality of death. Or perhaps we go the other way and focus so much on deliverance from the wrath that we forget the implications of the death and resurrection of Christ now. Perhaps we forget that we've been delivered to serve others. What about destiny and the way we control? Perhaps even as Christians we can feel like victims. God's sovereign plan for our lives feels more like fate than loving fatherly care and when this happens we question our responsibility and accountability we even as christians start to give excuses for our sin my genes made me do it g-e-n-e-s my upbringing made me do it my circumstances made me do it satan made me do it god made me do it Perhaps we look at our misfortunes as precisely that, bad fortune. On that road marked with suffering, to quote the song, we don't say, blessed be your name. Maybe we start thinking, God's got it in for me. 
or I've got to do something first so that God will love me. And it might be then that we try and take control and manipulate the variables, the kind of logic that reasons, well, if I do my quiet time in the morning, I'm sure I'll have a good day. And we lose the peace of knowing that no experience is outside of Jesus' sovereign control, that he sees all things and he himself will right all wrongs on the day of judgment. And finally, in terms of the higher power, we just experience a culmination of all these other pulls. In our daily words, actions, habits and rituals, we gradually demonstrate there are other loves of our lives that are higher and deeper than our love for Christ. These are the loves we go to first in order to find our way to connect, a way to live, a way to be delivered, a way of control. It's not that we don't believe in Jesus. We still have a place for him, even a very important place in our hearts, but subtly he's been subordinated and squashed and has to get in the queue. He is no longer preeminent in our lives. He is no longer Lord. And that's what it looks to be demagnetized. And you know what? Thank you. The, the, the way the way that we will be the most effective witnesses and evangelists is as we are magnetized by Christ. And the question now becomes, how do we become people who are fully magnetized? How do we become people who are fully magnetized? When I wrote this book, uh, a pastor friend of mine read it, and he came up to me, and he meant this as a compliment. He said, the end of the book was a massive anticlimax. I said, how is that a compliment? He said, well, at the end of the day, you're advocating the way we stand, stay magnetized is actually all the things that we always say. It's through the means of grace. It's through being with God's people on the Lord's Day. It's, it's word and sacrament. There is no new fangled thing that I'm going to tell you how we stay magnetized. Um, one, of the, one of the best, well, one, I find it a helpful il il illustration is this. The local church is like a medical army tent on the field of battle. And David and the other elders and the other leadership team, they're like the army medics. And every week, you guys have been out on the field. And at the end of the week, you're tired and you're hungry and you're disorientated. You've been pulled in all kinds of different directions. And you come together and gather together, and you're fed by God's word, you're bandaged up, you're reorientated, and then you're pushed out again. And you know what? In a week's time, you're tired. I'm going to do a Spurgeon. You're t I'll do this for about 10 minutes now. You're tired, you're hungry, you need to be bandaged up, and you come back, and then you're fed, and you're bandaged up, you're reorientated, and you're pushed out. And it happens again and again. It's the means of grace. That's how we stay magnetized. And that, that, again, I, you know, there's no magic bullet at, at, at that point. And so, how do we become people who are fully magnetized? Well, firstly, we, it's by loving Jesus, listening to him in his word. When Jesus prays, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray. This, has been a very, this has been a very important verse to me. I, that, in some ways, it's, it is related. But my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe me through their message. This is a revelation to me because Jesus is saying that he only prays for people who believe in their message. Who are they? It's the apostles. It's only the apostolic message that, that, that is the Jesus that then Jesus prays for his people. We need to listen to Jesus in his word. We need to obey his commands. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I, com I, I command. Our society finds it very difficult to put love and obedience together. We think they are two opposite things, but they are together. If you love me, you'll do what I say. 
We love Jesus by meditating on his majesty. We're, we're so distracted by all kinds of things, even like the way that our, you know, the physiology of what we do on our phones and all of this stuff, you know, how do we spend time with the Lord Jesus? How do we meditate on his majesty? How are we captivated by him? Um, you know, it's a constant, again, I know it's a, I know it's a cliche, but I say it to myself, you know, I'll go, I'll go and watch West Ham and I'll go and, you know, have a great time at a football event. And, you know, singing, singing, people singing their hearts out and think, do we, do we have that same passion when we're with the Lord's people? So we love Jesus. We love our identity in Jesus. I'll be preaching on this tomorrow morning from Isaiah 41 about how we need to understand that our identity if we construct our own identities, they, do, they, they will sh- be shown to be very weak identities, shaky and not stable. And we need to know where our identity comes from, that it comes from outside of us, it is given to us. And that is absolutely essential at the moment as we're going through a cultural identity crisis. Um, and again, if you're interested, Isaiah 41 I think is really helpful on this. Um, I'll be preaching on that tomorrow morning here. And look, we need to love Jesus' body, the church. Um, Mike Horton says, if the church is not first of all the place where Christians are made, then it cannot become a community of witnesses and servants. Um, Francis Schaeffer, the great evangelist. I see you've got a Schaeffer library now. I was saying to David, sorry, this is just, a, this is just a, my one anecdote of the day, if you'll permit me one. A few weeks ago, the, the seminary where I... Um, I do some teaching, Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest. Um, they had the Schaefer collection, and I, I was allowed five minutes to have a look at Schaefer's Bible. Incredible, just like writing, like writing all over it. Um, anyway, sorry, that's apropos nothing. Um, Schaefer, our relationship with each other is the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Christian community is the final apologetic. Here's the thing we have to wrestle with, because sometimes when I do this material and we talk about the connection belonging, and I say, that this side of the new heaven and new earth, that the church is the way that we experience true belonging and community. And people say, oh dear, I don't, is that, it's not my church. <laughs> don't use that as an example. Just, 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 just talk about Jesus. Don't talk about the church. But... Don't you see that there's a, that there's a, there's a, a, a community of people, real people coming together? The church should be it, faced with that student of mine who's been converted out of a, a very strong lesbian culture where they all looked after her and she felt be- belonging. The church needs to show how it is a greater sense of community and belonging and diversity. Now, that's the challenge for us. How do our churches show that, demonstrate that? People who are homeless, rootless, don't want to look inside the church and just see people who are gossiping, backbiting, devouring each other. They might as well stay where they are while they want to join a church. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, again, this is, you know, I used to talk about the church being like a, the, the show, a show home um, on the building site, and it's the greatest. Of course, the church isn't like a show home because you know there's a lot of mess in there. It's more like some huge restoration project that the Lord is using, and it's been built. Um, but again, I think you know the church should be an amazing witness to belonging and connectedness, and that's a challenge for for for, for us. Um, Again, that Schaefer quote is so powerful. It, it, the, it, it is the, the criterion the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Um, and, and that does include, in love, that does include things like discipline, church discipline. And it does include orthodox doctrine. It needs those things completely. So we stay magnetized by the means of grace, doing the things that we've always been doing. But I hope... This material is helpful in just saying what we do 
is relevant to what's happening out there. People are out there worshipping. They are looking for connection. They're looking for a norm. They're looking for deliverance. They're looking for destiny. They're looking for a higher power. We know underneath theologically what's going on. These are people who are suppressing the truth, substituting it for other things, running to God, running away from God. They know him and they don't know him. And we come with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is our connection. He is our norm. He is our deliverer. He is the one who is in control and yet we have significance and, and destiny and agency. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. We're going to have a break. And then the fourth session is called Over to You. Well, we're going to do it in a structured way. Give us a chance to reflect on the day. And I'd love to hear some more thoughts from you about anything that we've been talking about. I've left it fairly open-ended because it, sometimes this material needs a bit of time to... Um, just state, I suppose. Um, but we're going uh, to pray and then we're going to sing and then we're going to have a coffee break. Let's pray. Lord, it's so amazing that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the marvellous magnet. He is the one in whom we find connection, identity and belonging. He is the norm. He is the one who delivers us. He is the one who is in control. Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life, the resurrection and the life. Lord, we, we pray that we would be those by your spirit who stay close to that source, that we are magnetized so that others would be attracted to us because we are stuck to Christ. Forgive us, Lord, when we are daily pulled away or tempted to be pulled away by other things, when we foolishly and irrationally and tragically and sadly would rather drink stagnant water than come to the fount of living water. Lord, we pray that we would be those who would be recognising the great gifts you have given us in the means of grace to be able to stay magnetised, that we would love the Lord Jesus, love his word, love his people. And Lord, this mission that we've been talking about from the beginning of glorifying you through the building of the church and the calling of the nations, those three things would just be so interdependent upon each other. Lord, we pray that our prayer would be that of Spurgeon. May the Lord make us magnets for himself. Amen. Let's sing.